e agradecer a todos por participarem aqui hoje conosco do Talk com Tony Wagner, que é uma grande referência em educação, mundialmente reconhecido, autor de vários livros, com a participação na produção de dois grandes documentários, Most Likely to Succeed e The Finnish Phenomenon. Trabalhou por muitos anos na Universidade de Harvard, então estamos aqui hoje com ele e queremos dar boas-vindas a ele. A conversa com o Tony Wagner vai ser liderada em inglês, então eu vou mudar de língua para que ele possa nos entender e participar conosco. So welcome, Tony. Thank you so much for being here today with us. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to our virtual school, to our virtual village, and to the YouTube Live. Thank you so much, Priscilla, and thanks to Concept Escola for hosting this. I'm greatly looking forward to the conversation, and I promise you it will be a conversation. I want to show a, a short video, and then I'm going to do a short presentation and another short video, and then we're going to have time for questions. So before I go any further, I'd like you to see this very short video on the future of work, and I'll be right back as soon as it's over. Então, o Tony Wagner apresentou para a gente o vídeo do que, que é o futuro do trabalho, de tudo que, na verdade, não é tão futurístico assim, porque o futuro está acontecendo agora no presente. O Tony teve um problema na conexão dele com a internet nos Estados Unidos e ele está tentando reconectar, pelo mesmo motivo que a gente teve que se atrasar um pouco no início da nossa live de hoje. Então, com isso... Eu quero só contar um pouquinho 
sobre a nossa escola, a Escola Concept, que está aqui hoje representando é, essas lives que a gente chamou de, de uma série chamada In Mind, onde vamos ter vários talks ao longo do mês de maio. Teremos talks que seriam focados em mindfulness, em inovação, no new normal e em disrupção. E cada semana vamos trazer para vocês novas pessoas, novos pensadores, pessoas que vão provocar esse pensamento de perguntas, que vão estimular a nossa curiosidade. E pessoas que vão trazer informações novas desse novo momento que todos estamos vivendo. Toda semana, vamos também compartilhar com vocês uma série de artigos. E esses artigos vão estar conectados aos nossos pilares. Temos quatro pilares na Concept. Empreendedorismo, sustentabilidade, colaboração e fluência digital. E os nossos speakers estão, estarão todos conectados aos nossos pilares. Então, hoje, com o Tony Wagner, a intenção é que ele possa falar para a gente um pouquinho sobre o nosso pilar de empreendedorismo, que ele possa nos inspirar um pouco, um pouco mais sobre esse pilar e colocar em contexto o que, que esse pilar significa hoje, no momento em que estamos vivendo. E o que, que será desse futuro que estamos vivendo agora no presente, uma vez que essa transição acontecer de voltarmos aos nossos campos físicos da escola, das escolas, ao voltarmos às nossas vidas cotidianas. Então, a intenção do Tony hoje é falar justamente sobre isso. Na semana que vem, a gente vai dar as boas-vindas a Marion Kilonen, que trabalha como a Head do Departamento de Educação da Finlândia, em Helsinki. E ela vai estar trazendo muitas ideias para a gente na área de sustentabilidade do que, que significa sustentabilidade com relação à educação sustentável e como que isso se conecta ao mundo que estamos vivendo e como que isso se conecta a essa educação que deveria estar acontecendo nas escolas. Então, a Marion, junto com a OECD, junto com outras organizações, tem feito, feito várias pesquisas para falar sobre essa transformação da educação na área de educação sustentável. Então, a gente está super, é, é, anim... estamos super animados para poder ter essas oportunidades ao longo das próximas semanas com esses speakers, a Marion sendo a nossa speaker da semana que vem. E com isso, o Tony voltou e a gente teve um tempinho para conversar um pouquinho sobre a nossa série In Mind. So, Tony, we'll turn it back to you. Um, we're happy that you could make it back. Well, again, my, my apologies for the internet problems. You would think I live in a third world country with a lack of internet access here, but actually I only live in rural New Hampshire, <laughs> but it, it might as well in some cases be a developing country for our terrible internet. But anyway, to proceed, you know, when I started my teaching career uh, nearly 50 years ago, it was the twilight of the industrial era and people were beginning to talk about the new knowledge economy. Well, you know, that was 50 years ago. And today we no longer have a knowledge economy. We live in the innovation era and jobs that merely require manipulating information are rapidly disappearing. They're being replaced by computers. Increasingly, knowledge is a commodity growing exponentially, changing constantly. It's on every internet connected device. You don't need a teacher to acquire knowledge anymore. And in fact, employers no longer care how much knowledge our students have. What employers care about, what the world cares about, is not what they know, but what they can do with what they know. I'll give a couple of interesting examples. You know, Google used to only hire kids from Ivy League universities and only interview those who had the highest test scores and the highest GPAs. And Then along came Laszlo Bach, and he's senior VP of people operations. He analyzes the data like a good Googler, and lo and behold, discovers that there was no correlation between those kinds of benchmarks they were using and success at Google or in the innovation era. In fact, he said, the skills you need to succeed in a competitive academic environment bear no relationship 
to the skills you need to succeed in the innovation era. Right now, today, Google doesn't ask where you went to college. In fact, they don't even care whether or not you went to college. 15% of Google's new hires no longer have a college degree. And they no longer ask for your test scores because they've discovered that those are terrible indices of the things that they care the most about. Well, I thought that was Google and you know, that's California and we know about California. But you know, then I went to Vietnam at the invitation of Deloitte. I spoke in Ho Chi Minh City to CEOs from the, the region. And before that I had lunch with a CEO of Deloitte in the, re, in, the, in the area. And we were talking and she knew of my affiliation to Harvard. And she sort of looked at me with a smile and she said, you know, we used to hire the best students from the best universities, but it turns out they didn't work out so well. She said, now we look for good students, but then we put them through a summer long boot camp to see how they solve problems collaboratively. We live in a very different world today and a world that the COVID virus is only gonna turn upside down even further. More and more jobs are gonna be done by computers, by artificial intelligence. And so the kinds of credentials and skills that you needed to get and keep a good job 25 years ago are not the same. So what do young people need to know and be able to do in the innovation era? Now, first of all, I have to clarify a couple of things. What is innovation after all? Well, there's two common definitions of innovation. One is all about bringing new possibilities to life. Think Steve Jobs, think the iPhone or Mark Zuckerberg, uh, innovation I'm less fond of, but at any rate, it's bringing new possibilities to life that were non-existent. That's one kind of innovation. And I don't think you can educate kids to be a Steve Job or a Mark Zuckerberg. In fact, as you probably know, they were both college dropouts anyway. On the other hand, there's another kind of innovator. And that is someone who is a creative problem solver. And I don't mean just in high tech. We need desperately creative problem solvers everywhere in the world in developing countries dealing with basic problems such as clean water, health, education, and so on. And in many, many other domains, nonprofit, for-profit, the skills of creative problem solving are the ones that are in the greatest demand. So the question now is what creative problem solver? Well, here's the good news. We are born curious, creative, imaginative. That's the human DNA. The average five-year-old asks a hundred questions a day. I know that because I have grandchildren now and they pass to me with a question. Every kindergartner thinks of himself or herself as an artist, but then something happens. We call it school because the longer kids are in school, the fewer questions they ask, the more they become preoccupied with getting the right answers. So to try to begin to understand what we need to do differently, I interviewed a wide variety of young people in their 20s, all of whom were already recognized as very successful creative problem solvers. Equal number of young women and young men, some from privilege, some from poverty, and initially just in the United States, but I've since then interviewed young people all over the world. And of course, I you know, want to ask everything about their lives, what made the difference. Uh, I interview all of their parents, if I can, uh, to find out what the parents had done that had made the greatest difference. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those findings in a moment. But the topic that interests me most, of course, is their education. Well, when I ask them about their education, that's where my first unfortunate discovery occurs. You see, some of these young people had gone to leading universities, specifically Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and they all told me they had become successful creative problem solvers in spite of their schooling, not because of it. But I pressed, I said, you know, surely you can tell me about somebody, some teacher who's made a difference in your life. 
And indeed, they all could. They all could name a teacher who'd made a difference in their lives. So I went and interviewed all of those teachers to see what they had done differently. And that led to my second troubling discovery. You see, all of those highly Uh, impactful teachers went to graduate school, wherever the grade range was, they taught differently than their peers, but remarkably similar to one another, as it turned out. Then I visited those schools that had a reputation for successful. I went to the MIT Media Lab. I went to the brand new Olin College of Engineering. I went to the D School at Stanford University. I went to a number of secondary schools, high tech high, about which you'll find out more in a moment, new tech high. I went to really leading elementary programs, Reggio Emilia and Montessori. And I saw a remarkable pattern of similarities in across all of these schools and the kinds of teaching I saw there, as well as in how my outlier teachers were teaching. They were all teaching in ways that were very similar to one another, yet very different from what we see in most schools, indeed, around the world. So I come to understand there's five essential contradictions between the traditional culture of schooling that is now nearly a century old and the culture of learning to be a creative problem solver, an innovator for the 21st century. Briefly, there are the following. Contradiction number one. You know, uh, traditional schooling is all about celebrating and rewarding individual achievement. That's fine, there's a place for that. But I've come to understand that innovation is a team sport. There is no innovation without deep and regular collaboration. Knowing this, these teachers at these schools I just described created accountable teams for projects that they undertook in the classroom. Contradiction number two, traditional schooling is all about compartmentalizing knowledge. Physics lives over here very far from chemistry, which is quite far from biology, let alone math or the social sciences or the humanities. But what I came to understand is that there is not a single problem that can be understood, let alone solved today in the confines of a single disciplinary silo. Knowing this, these innovative teachers created multidisciplinary courses where teams of students worked on a real problem or on a big question that had no ready answer. Contradiction three is about the culture of the classroom. The culture in so many classrooms I visit all over the world is a culture of passivity. It's a culture of compliance. It's a culture where there's usually only one person in the room doing all the talking very different from the culture of classrooms where young innovators are learning to, to solve problems. They're expected to take initiative. They're expected to question authority. They, above all, are encouraged to give voice to their questions, to their ideas, to their concerns. Learning is active, not passive. And the teacher sees his or her role primarily as that of a performance coach and a mentor coaching students to higher performance standards. Contradictions four and five, I think are the most challenging of all. Contradiction four is all about the F word in school. Failure, worst thing that can happen. How do you fail? You fail by making more mistakes than other people. We have a bell curve and people who make lots and lots of mistakes fall on this end of the curve and people who make no mistakes get the A's and fall on that end of the curve. But here's the problem. Innovation demands that you take risks, that you make mistakes, and that you fail. I went to IDEO, the most innovative design company in the world. Turns out the company motto is fail early and fail often. Other companies talk about failing cheap, failing smart, failing smart, fast but failing. Now they don't mean failing in an academic sense. They're talking about the methodology, which is at the essence of innovation. 
and that is iteration, learning through trial and error, going from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, learning from mistakes as you go along. Now that's not just the world of innovation. In fact, if you really think about it, that's how most of us learn most of the time. How do we learn to talk? How do we learn to walk? By making lots of mistakes. What if someone had said to us, I'm sorry, you can't talk until you can speak in complete and grammatically correct sentences. And you certainly can't walk and, until you can walk in a straight line, no crawling allowed. And bicycle riding, absolutely out of the question because we know you're gonna fall and skin your knee. Now, in fact, if I could take a poll right now, which I do with live audiences, I would Ray, ask all of you in the room, or now on our chat, to raise your hands if you've learned more from your mistakes than your successes. Well, I confess I'm one. I've just written a memoir called Learning by Heart, an unconventional education, just out two weeks ago. And the book is as much about my mistakes and my failures as it is about some successes along the way. But frankly, it's more about how did I come to uh, learn a way of learning from my mistakes uh, as much as anything else, first as a student and then as a struggling young teacher. So the challenge we need to rethink fundamentally is how do we evaluate our students? And how do we stop thinking of comparing students to one another on a very narrow set of skills and capabilities and instead really think about how do we develop every young person's unique capabilities. There's no bell curve for, you know, who I am in developing my fullest capability as a person. We don't, we don't need to grade people that way. In fact, the adult world doesn't work that way. You know, you don't want to fly with a C minus airline pilot, do you? Or, uh, you know, a D plus dentist? No, the adult world really only has three grades, A, B, or incomplete. A B is a performance standard expectation for most every job that you can think of, whether it's airline pilot or dentist or plumber, electrician, you gotta meet a standard to get licensed, to keep a job. Occasionally we reward real human excellence, but that's not common. So if you don't meet the standard, what happens? Well, you keep trying. You don't suddenly fail, drop out, give up, get an F, go home. The only F I recognize is the failure not to try, the failure not to show up at all. Otherwise, the only three grades I, I use as a teacher and can really defend are A, B, or incomplete. Now to the fifth contradiction, and it's all about motivation. We use carrots and sticks rewards and punishments, fear as a motivating factor in our schools. And I think it does tremendous damage to kids. Kids are terrified of failure, afraid of making a single mistake. They become highly, highly risk averse, which of course makes them very poorly adapted to the, to the world of innovation. By contrast, these schools I've been describing rely on and encourage much more intrinsic motivation. And the young innovators whom I profiled in my book, Creating Innovators, told me that they were far more likely to do their best work in school when it was an assignment worth doing, not some silly make work or some worksheet. It was a project they were engaged by or a deep question that really interested them. And at the same time, as they grew older, they were interested in, in having jobs where they could make a difference, where they could make a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs put it once. So when I went further to try to understand what had those parents and teachers done differently to encourage intrinsic motivation, motivation that comes from within, I found three essential ingredients, play, passion, and purpose. Much more exploratory, imaginative play. To the extent possible, they are encouraged to get outside. Teachers created a space for what I'll call disciplined play in having young people pursue their own interests, something I'll come back to in a moment. But as these young people grew older, their parents were very 
insistent that they try new things, they be exposed to new possibilities, they explore new interests, and they encourage them no matter what the young person's interests were. And so what happened was that over time, as young people became more and more clear about their interests and they grew those interests and developed them, those interests became passions. So they went from discovering interests through play to then deepening their interests into a passion. But in every case, those passions morphed. They, they evolved into a sense of purpose. And that's because both adults, teachers, and parents encouraged these young people to think about the fact that we are not here on this earth just to collect our paychecks, just to serve ourselves. We have some responsibility to give back and to make a difference. And that's what all of these young innovators whom I have interviewed all over the world have in common. They really want to make a difference. They are intrinsically motivated. They are naturally curious. They are willing and able to take initiative. They ask great questions. All things that employers value most highly now. And I know this because I've interviewed employers as well and I've written about that in both my book, Creating Innovators, and also in a previous book called The Global Achievement Gap. So let me take a couple of minutes to talk about a few things that I think parents and teachers can do to support the young innovators in your classroom or in your home. First, as both parents and teachers, we really must continue to nurture and encourage our children's and young people's curiosity. I encourage every young person to keep a question journal and write down a question or a problem or a concern of interest to them. And then periodically in class, I encourage teachers to make a little bit of time in their curriculum. And it doesn't matter how busy or packed your curriculum is, you can do this. Take a little bit of time to encourage young people to pursue their interests, to pursue their questions, and then come back to the class with what they've learned. Parents can do much the same at home. Uh, secondly, I think it's really important that we who are leaders in schools incent our teachers to try new things. I, I think every school should have an innovation fund to which teams of teachers can apply for money to create a new interdisciplinary curriculum or to perhaps develop a digital-based portfolio for evaluating students cumulatively as opposed to just one shot letter grades. Uh, these are the kinds of innovations that I think are critically important. And why do I say teams of teachers? Because more and more we come to understand that not just in the world of innovation, but in the world of education, isolation is the enemy of improvement. Isolation is the enemy of innovation. And so it is clear that we'll do better research and vet ideas before trying them so that they cannot fail. They don't need to fear failure. Because in my experience, teachers fear failure as much as, as do kids. They feel judged by kids every bit as much as the kids feel judged as well. It's an entirely fear-based system. And so we have to nurture what I call educational research and development, R&D. Without R&D, there is no change. There is no innovation. There is no improvement. So these are a couple of things just at the school level and in the individual classroom that I believe and have seen make a critical difference in schools around the world. Uh, and certainly in uh, Priscilla School and in others, where teachers are encouraged to work in teams, where they're developing projects that engage kids, encouraging them to take initiative and to be curious. So I wanna share one with you. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Ted Dinter Smith on a documentary film called Most Likely to Succeed. If you haven't seen it yet, it's on most um, social, social uh, uh, platforms, including uh, iTunes, YouTube, video, and others. So you can rent it or even buy it. But it's been shown all over the world in countless school communities. And it, it's a wonderful video that provokes a lot of really thoughtful conversation and discussion. And it would be a great place to start in your community if you haven't yet. So I'm gonna show you a small clip from this video. It's a five minute clip. 
of a ninth grade class in a school called High Tech High, one of these new exciting laboratory schools, this one on the West Coast, serving, by the way, predominantly minority children from poverty. Uh, but this is a school where every class is team taught by pairs of teachers and all the classes are multidisciplinary. So in this short video, you'll see a humanities teacher who teaches history as well as English and a science and engineering teacher. who also teaches math, work for most of the, look for three things. First of all, what content knowledge are these young people learning? Because academic content knowledge still matters. Necessary, but not sufficient. What skills are they learning? Because in the innovation era, skills matter more. How are they applying their knowledge? And finally, how are they being motivated to learn? What are the teachers doing to encourage intrinsic motivation? Because intrinsic motivation actually matters most. Because if you're intrinsically motivated, you will continuously acquire new content knowledge and new skills throughout your life. So let's watch this short video and then I'll come back for some questions and discussion. The philosophy of High Tech High is founded largely on the idea of kids making, doing, building, shaping, and inventing stuff. The engineers that I know, the architects that I know, the artists that I know, uh, the great educators that I know, the entrepreneurs that I know, are all so sort of perplexed and curious about how they can do it better the next time. And that type of perplexity leads to engagement. It leads to learning. It leads to innovation. We are trying to have that type of perplexity and curiosity get inculcated in our students in everyday practice. Both Linkabit and Qualcomm, one of our problems was being able to hire enough qualified people, enough trained people. And so it's kind of a long-term view to set up high tech high. Like if you have two spacing in point zero one, the gears will connect. We didn't know that it was all going to work until maybe four weeks before the exhibition. Yeah. Three weeks. I mean, we knew we knew that pieces of it were working. And, and even those pieces were impressive. We had to learn about civilizations, the Mayans, the Romans, and the Greeks. And Scott and Mike didn't want to just teach us this. So they came up with this big wheel, which is a big gear, which has a lot of drawings on it, and it's connected to all these other mechanisms, and they each represented our theory. So um, I learned about Mayans, the Greeks, and the Romans, and I really based my theory off of the Romans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it has to do with expanding, they were always expanding, mm -hmm. and I, I realized that they were expanding not because you were not just for fun of it, but they needed resources for all the people back home. Then they had to, on their own, develop and defend an idea on why they think civilizations rise and fall. So we had to create like a flow chart just explaining what our theory was, and then we got critiques on it, um, and then we created a group one. Another piece is on the mechanical side. They need to take what's already an abstract concept with their theory, and they have to take that and actually physically manifest it. They have some very preliminary metrics they need to use. They know that there's going to be a big wheel turning at a certain RPM. They know how many teeth that is, so they have basically a box to work within, some bounds to work within, and they have to make everything. <laughs> yeah, we Oh, I put the wrong side in. Oh my god. Oh my god. 
so we have an exhibition that we're preparing for right now and it'll be tomorrow night and there will be thousands of people here looking at student work uh, students presenting their work visitors looking at the work um, students presenting their work to each other and i think that idea of making work public that's a missing piece to me in schools in general for most of you this is probably the biggest project that you've ever exhibited a lot of you it's the first project that you've ever really had a public exhibition of right cool we're gonna be here if you need to go and stand but we're gonna keep working with you are great idea of sort of making something and having a public exhibition and having people come look at it and you have that feeling that we all have like how did they do that you really need to understand it and you really need to understand why you need to know this to be able to complete the project astounded me was that while doing research my theory it actually fit with a lot of these civilizations it wasn't just like some random theory when kids have that feeling it's transformative for them i made this and everyone's coming to look at it So I'm back. Priscilla, I'm hoping you have some great questions for me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony, for inspiring us and talking to us a little bit about what does it mean to be an innovator in the 21st century? And I think that with that, um, the inspirations that you were able to share with us via video, uh, I think has led uh, one of our participants, one of our audience members to ask a certain question here that has a lot to do with what you just talked about. So this participant apparently has read one of the articles that you have published, the article that was called Calling All Innovators. And the person mentions that you mentioned collaboration as one of the essential differences that characterize innovative schools that are open to the culture of learning. We know that we are part of a context in which rankings, tests, bonuses, rewards, and punishments are still highly present in schools. Often these mechanisms are not explicit, but are hidden in small actions or behavioral control, competitiveness, and external regulation as they were part of our training. How could we promote a change of mentality in the school community with this regard? How could we make the relationship between autonomy, innovation, collaboration, a triad that is visible in concrete actions? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know how I can uh, you know, answer all of that, but I think it begins with helping the adults in our community understand a changing world. So often we educators wanna start with a solution rather than the problem, the answer rather than the question. You know, it's reform du jour, it's fad of the month, much too often in education, in my too many years of experience. So like the challenge is to start with the problem. How has the world changed since many of us went to school? And what are the skills and dispositions that matter most today? And that's why we made that film most likely to succeed from which you just saw a small clip to really help communities uh, have that conversation about the nature of the changing world. Because I think only once we really understand how important creative problem solving is and how important the skills of collaboration, of taking initiative and all of these other things are in today's world, only then I think are we going to be willing to consider leaving some of the trappings of a century old school system behind. You know, a lot of people are afraid of change in education. I understand that, but we need to understand there's two kinds of risks. There's the risk of changing, going to the unknown, but there's also the risk to our children of not changing, 
of being stuck in a form of schooling that is really becoming increasingly obsolete. But we can't just pronounce that to our teachers and parents. We have to help them discover that. We have to do interviews with employers and videotape them, do interviews and focus groups with recent graduates. It's about how they were most and least well prepared. So there's a lot that we need to do as education leaders to better help our communities understand this changing world. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you're absolutely right. We, re we really need to show parents, right, the value of this new education model, right? And what does it mean to be educated for the 21st century, right? And not that it is an education that is happening in the future, but it's actually the future is happening now. And I think this pandemic came to show exactly that. And this connects very closely to our second question, which um, this person mentioned that one of the themes that you've explored deeply in a lot of your publications and, and in your reflections is multidisciplinary learning as a possibility beyond specialization. So since innovation requires knowing how to apply an interdisciplinary approach to solve a problem or create something new, would you say that schools that develop a project-based approach already represent this contemporary perspective or are there still aspects in the perspective that need to expand their potential? Well, again, I, I think project-based learning is a, is a really key innovation. But it's not the only innovation based learning. Where you take a problem, say uh, water quality in your community, and you try to understand what is not, uh, what is causing water quality to be less than it should be, or air quality, or whatever it happens to be. Or a problem that I know recently where in one school community there was a serious uh, traffic uh, uh, spot where you know, it was unsafe for kids to cross the road. And so that was a problem-based learning. Uh, a class started studying the problem by looking at the traffic rates and trying to understand, well, who do we have to talk to to get a crosswalk put in that would be safe? And then they ultimately presented to the town council who finally put in you know lights and a raised crosswalk to make it safe. This was a group of middle school, seventh and eighth grade kids who did this work. So that's an example of problem-based learning. There are Socratic dialogues where you really talk about an essential question. Uh, the essential question might be, um, what are the most important steps we can take today to prevent a future coronavirus outbreak? Uh, that's, that's a question that doesn't have a quick or ready answer, but you would have to use multiple disciplines to begin to understand that question and to answer it. So those are just some forms of uh, interdisciplinary approaches that I've seen, and I've seen you, them used from elementary school to all the way to graduate school with tremendous success. Yeah, and I think that connects very closely to what you mentioned with regard to play, passion, and purpose, right? Always connecting that and the traffic problem, I think is a perfect example of how they were passionate about the issue that affected their community. Um, it was something that they were able to do collaboratively and they found purpose in getting engaged with that, um, with that problem. So when you connect that, it makes things um, a lot easier. It makes it fun, right? To, to have those explorations and it doesn't really look like school. Right. Exactly. It looks like just exploration. In a sense, it comes full purpose. I mean, full circle, because purpose is in its finest expression is disciplined play. What were these kids doing? They were playing, but in a serious way. Uh, and the, the work of artists and, and, and scientists is the work of disciplined play, passion that has morphed into a sense of purpose that becomes adult play. Yeah, um, just to connect to what you just mentioned, Tony, I had the opportunity to teach a vacation course for middle school learners that was called University Portfolio. So building your university portfolio and starting at the middle school level and starting to think about that. And we got to the point where they were looking at service learning projects. 
And um, when we were looking at those projects in the beginning, they're like, well, what do I have to do? Like, what, what kinds of projects do I have to do? And I said, well, it's not about the have to. It's about finding your passion. What are your hobbies? What are the things that really spark that curiosity and make you want to get out of bed in the morning? What are those things? And once you find, you know, those hobbies and those passions, you're just going to build upon all that. And that will become your service learning project because you're going to think how to connect that to providing for others, to giving back to society. So I think that, you know, goes hand in hand with a lot of the things that you've shared today. And it gives us all kind of nurtures that food for thought. One of the questions that came from Leo Minor is, what are your thoughts on bringing the startup's mindset to the schools, both inside and outside the classroom? Well, the startup mindset is, is a great example of what we've been talking about, because it's, it's often around trying to, trying to find a new way to solve an existing problem or tackling a brand new kind of problem. And it involves teamwork. It involves taking initiative. It involves risk-taking, but smart risk-taking, risk-taking risk based on some research, based on evidence. <clears throat> so to me, all of those are skills and dispositions that I think belong both in and out of the classroom. And I think we need to break down the classroom walls and have more kids have the opportunities for both service learning and work-based internships where they see these skills and dispositions in action. And I want to make one other thing clear. We've been talking a lot about the future of work, and that's where I started. But something we all need to understand, the skills you need for work in the 21st century are exactly the same skills you need for active and informed citizenship. And they're the same skills you need for lifelong learning. And I would add they're the same skills you need for creative leisure. So often we're raising kids to be passive consumers in and out of the classroom. And our planet can no longer afford infinite consumption. And so I think the more we can help young people understand ways in which they can be creative. And interestingly, the coronavirus pandemic is causing a lot of that for both adults and kids. Many of them no longer are, either, they're fed up with consuming screen time 18 hours a day. They're finding hobbies, they're rediscovering passions and, and interests that they've long forgotten or put away. So we need a lot more of that in our schools and in, in our homes. Right, and connecting to the home. I think that a lot of families have been able to spend a ton of time with their children over the past month or so. And this has really um, influenced, right, the family dynamic and what are the roles of um, parents within this new form of educating their children. And with that, there was um, one of our audience members wrote, Tony, you said that there is a stark contrast to the seven survival skills of the future and the focus of education today. Instead of teaching students to answer questions, we should teach them to ask questions. Instead of preparing them for college, we should prepare them for life. So how might we engage families so that this thought could also be a part of their children's education, but starting from home? Right. Well, I think it begins at home, of course. It begins with conversations over the dinner table. You know, uh, too often we say to kids, so, so how'd, you, how'd you do in school today? As opposed to, you know, did you have any new thoughts, any new questions come to mind today? Uh, and really have a more engaging kind of conversation as one that's less about their performance and more about, did they have a new thought? Did they have a new question, a new idea? So that to me is critically important, the kind of conversations we have with young people. Next, it's taking their questions seriously. You know, it used to be thought by child psychologists, even as recently as 20 years ago, that young people asked a lot of questions, I'm talking about five, six, seven-year-olds, to get attention. But now the latest research shows that's not true. They're trying to make meaning. They're trying to understand the world. And that doesn't stop when you're five, six, or seven. You know, 15, 16, 17 year olds are doing the same thing. Sometimes our 27 year olds are still doing the same thing. And we need to take their questions, their concerns, and their interests seriously. Now to the college issue, I think it's really important that we understand that while college may work for many, 
uh, it's less and less of a sure bet for many. It's expensive. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult for kids to travel long distances, to be away from home, or to have to be able to go to have to go to school and not have to earn a living. So these things can be very challenging, and we have to understand that we need our young people to leave secondary school, not just college ready, so they should be that, but also more importantly, innovation ready, so that they can do a new startup, they can take initiative, they can explore a, a work-based internship or take a gap year and do a service learning project for a year. So the skills of initiative and responsible risk-taking, want to underscore the responsible part, and uh, willingness to try new things and keep questioning, I think are lifelong traits that start when children are very, very young and need to be continuously nurtured and encouraged throughout the lives of our young people. Right, right, you're absolutely right. And I think someone here has um, done some additional research on your background and they mentioned that as an English language, as a, as a former English um, language teacher, and, um, and I think this person is also an English language and literature te teacher, I'd like to know where you position the literacy in your thinking and reflections about innovation and contemporary education. So what's the role of literacy in all of this? Great question. I actually explore that a lot in my, my newest book, my memoir that I mentioned earlier, Learning by Heart, which is uh, available now where I really talk about all of the ways in which school failed me, and I also failed school. I was a dropout from high school and a two-time college dropout, but where I tried to become the, the teacher I wished I'd had as a student. And above all, to the, to the question, to me, the development of student voice is the most critical aspect of literacy typically think of the beginning of literacy as decoding words. Well, of course, that's critical. It's, and getting into the habit of reading. It's one thing to learn to read, but the other to be, have the habit of reading to learn. So I think that's critically important, but as important and increasingly when young people become adolescents, I would argue is co-equally important is giving young people an opportunity to develop the skills of oral and written communication by providing them with topics of interest to them, by enabling them to write editorials about things of concern to them, write short stories, write poems, develop their voice in many, many different ways. And I chronicle how I tried to do that for 10 years as a secondary uh, English teacher in, in my memoir. Yeah, and it's so interesting because um, there's there's this one young lady um, at the concept school in Sao Paulo, a grade five learner who actually found this opportunity um, during this COVID crisis to write. And she has now published a newsletter every two or three days within her community. And she talks about what families could be doing, what our authorities are saying, what her opinion is, all of this. And she shares her thoughts through this newsletter and she's Wonderful. only in grade five. So and it's you know, so inspiring. Gonna, that's, that's gonna stay with her all her life. This is a, that's a perfect example of a young person finding a passion. And I'm sure there were some adults who are actively encouraging it. I know your school does that and I bet her parents did as well. And you know, that's gonna stay with her and influence her choice of jobs and her success in jobs the rest of her life. Well, I think we may have time for one more question. Priscilla, if you've got a, a good last question. I do, I do. And um, this question goes out to your advice to school leaders. We talked a little bit about teachers. We talked a little bit about parents. This one goes out to school leaders. And George asked this question, which is how, do, how can school leaders nurture innovation in their learning environments? Well, I've already tried to answer that question in, in a couple of ways. Right. One is by really helping the community understand what is innovation, why do we need it? It can't be seen as the latest shiny new fad and the answer being here, here's an iPad or here's a whiteboard. There's innovation for you. <laughs> no, it's a mindset. It's a set of knowledge, skills and, and dispositions or attributes 
that need to be actively nurtured. But adults need to understand that in order to support it. Then I think leaders need to actively encourage teachers, teams of teachers to take responsible risks. I mentioned the idea of creating an innovation fund that teams of teachers can apply for uh, to, to develop an interdisciplinary course or new forms of assessment, uh, like the back to school night you saw in that video at High Tech High. Uh, there are lots of ways in which we can encourage innovation, but it really does begin with understanding the need, understanding the problem. My favorite quote from Einstein is, the formulation of the problem is often more essential than the solution. And I think that the biggest mistake many of us as educational leaders make, and I made them too, by the way, as a school principal, and I write about that failure in my memoir, but the biggest mistake we can make is to provide the answer without enabling anyone to ask the question. Absolutely. And that leaves me with the final reflection that connects exactly to what you're saying. I think that um, to go back to this question about school leaders, I think that we can really nurture innovation when we, as school leaders, if we really live the mission, vision, and values of our school, and when we hire for the mission, vision, and value, we hire excellent professionals that will also carry the mission, vision, and value, and in values, then those pro professionals need to be trusted. And once those professionals are trusted in the classroom, they'll do the magic, they'll run the show. Because well said. they're, I mean, right? The, I think, I'm so glad you said that because we yeah. as education leaders have to model the behaviors we seek. Right. We have to model transparency. We have to model collaboration. Right. And we have to model responsible risk-taking and seek, actively seek feedback for continuous improvement. All things we want our teachers to do, but sometimes we're a little reluctant to initiate right. ourselves. So right. I'm so glad you said that, Priscilla. And while I have a moment, I want to thank you so much, you and your colleagues, for creating this opportunity for us. Uh, it's been really wonderful having a chance to connect with some folks from around the world on this great conversation. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And today at our schools, we had Spirit Week, and today was Dress Up as your um, COVID hero. And I think that since we're here talking about education in the US, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So I think our COVID heroes are really our educators, our teachers in our learning environments. There's so many other COVID heroes to celebrate, but I think that today we really wanna celebrate all the educators out there who have done a phenomenal job in really engaging students in a virtual learning environment, which we know is not easy. So, out, you know, a shout out and a big kudos to all the educators that are out there um, listening to us and enjoying this conversation and being part of this moment. And I hope to see all of you again next week. We have another In Mind conversation with Marion Killinen on sustainability and the focus of education and sustainable practices. So with that, Tony, thank you so much. Such an honor. And thank you everyone else who supported us throughout this, um, this program. Thank you. My great pleasure. Goodbye all, hope to see you again. Goodbye.